Hello, hello, and welcome back to Advancing Synapse, where this week we're back in the world of Spark. And that's because there's been some advancements, there's been some changes. Mainly we now have these things called parameters, which means we can do all of the good orchestration, run this thing in a loop, pass different parameters to it. We can do all the cool stuff that we normally work with. So it makes the whole thing so much more open, more usable, and I'm going to show you how it works. So as normal, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll go from there. Okay, so first things first, we've got a blog page that's telling you how it all works. That's now live on the doc, so you can go and read about it yourself. I'll pop a link in the, uh, in the bottom, just down there. And then, yeah, so how does it work? Well, we see this parameters cell. And if you're familiar with kind of open source vanilla -y Spark, there is a thing called paper mill. And this works on a cell injection basis. So we can mark a cell as a parameters cell. And then at runtime, as soon as we run this, if it's marked, whenever it finds something marked as a parameter cell, it'll inject a new bit of code underneath, overriding anything with the new parameters we've given it. So if we have a parameter saying table name, and we mark that as a parameter cell. And then when we kick off that notebook, if we say, by the way, there's a parameter called table name, then it's going to insert a bit of code underneath and go override table name, make it this value instead. So we're kind of just overriding existing values at runtime based on whatever is marked as that parameters cell. What we're doing. So that's now in, that's now works. So we can go and have a look. And again, we can now hook it up to that orchestration pipeline. So we can use that data factory pipeline that's baked inside Synapse and try and dig it in, try and get it working. So let's have a bit of a look. Um, super quick example. I've got some data living in my raw area of my lake. AdventureWorks tables. This is the same stuff I started with when I was first looking at Synapse. And I've got a load of tables in my base layer that I want to try and populate with essentially my nice cleaned versions. So I've got a few different ones in there. Really, really straightforward. Pick up some Parquet, land it as Delta. What we're trying to do. Okay, so popping over into Synapse, let's have a look at this new thing that we've got. So if I go to my develop area, I can go and grab, got a notebook. Call it loads to TSV to data. Note, I did say I'm loading Parquet, but because I've published this, I can no longer change the name of my notebook. So I'd stop calling it load CSV unless I copy and paste this into a new notebook and oh, I can't be bothered. Okay, right, so what do we have? Right at the top, I've got this tuple customer and, and SEH, my schema. So I've got a tabling and um, schema that I've marked as this parameter cell. So it's like toggle parameter cell is saying this is the one Anything, any variable I create here and set here, these are valid things I might want to override at runtime. So essentially when I run this, it's going to come in, it's going to go, oh, there's my parameter cell. What have I been given as my parameters? In this case, TBL and uh, thing. And it's going to override and say, no, actually, basically just ignore what was previously set, make that um, product instead of uh, my customer. It's that kind of thing. So it's really, really straightforward. There's nothing particularly crazy going on with parameters. It's just going, actually just, you know, replace whatever they'd said previously with a new value. That is it. That is the whole complexity behind parameters. But we don't need to do that. So that's going to be done for us because we've marked that as our parameter cell. So that is the biggie. Uh, that's the thing that makes it all work. And then there's a few things. So I'm deriving a place in my leg using an F string. Uh, I'm printing out. This is what I'm going to do. Makes sense. Um, I'm going on the other side saying this is the structure, just a bit of just general logging so I can follow what's happening. Uh, and then I'm just writing it to a Delta table. So I'm overwriting, really blunt, nothing fancy, just completely kill anything that's there, replace it with a new thing we're trying to work with. Okay, so that runs, you can see that runs, you've got the outputs going through it. That's fairly straightforward. So how do we actually hook it up? How do we parameterize it? So. Uh, if we just create a new orchestration, keep clicking the wrong place, uh, click, create a new pipeline, I'll show you how we hook it up. So we've got these signups options and we've got notebook in there. So I'm going to do, I'll do a new notebook. So click in there. I get a few options I can work with. So let's get my settings up. And I can say, what do I want to do? I get a list of all my notebooks and I can choose the notebook I'm trying to run. Now I still don't have a dynamic setting here. So unlike Databricks where I can say, at runtime, just get data factories just to dynamically decide which notebook to run. 
I'm still fairly fixed in terms of I pick a notebook and it runs that notebook, no choices. But I do now have base parameters. So I can say, I want you to run that notebook and when you run, here are the parameters to supply. So this is what it's gonna jam into that inserted parameter cell underneath my toggle parameter uh, cell. So what do you wanna want? So we're gonna want it to be, so expect something called TBL. So again, this needs to match up exactly with the variables that are in there. Otherwise it's gonna be, well, overriding something that doesn't exist really. Okay, it's gonna be a string and I want that to be product. Okay, I'm going to do another one. This is gonna be my schema. Again, this is gonna be a string. And I want it to be sales LT. So, simple as that. So I can now save that. Let's just publish it out. Really simple, being super lazy with namings. <laughs> and then we can just actually just hit go and see how that works. Um, nothing particularly crazy. Everything fairly straightforward. Publish complete, okay. So we add a trigger, trigger it now, push it out. So again, my current one is expecting it to be customer. So if I left it as it currently was, hard-coded, it would run for the customer table. This test, is it gonna run for the product table is the question. Now, I had a hell of a time working through this and working out, is it running? What's it actually doing when I hit go? Uh, it's kind of interesting how they've uh, hooked up the, uh, the validation. You can see I've had some successes, some failures. It's been a bit mixed. So while it's kicking this off, let's go and have a look. So we can see there's a notebook, we can see it's in progress. We get a couple of bits of detail. So it's, we know we've kicked off the notebook and that's it. That's all the information that we have from the pipeline, which isn't great, honestly, uh, but we can hop over this side. So that's why on the monitoring thing, we've got pipeline run, so that's our kind of surface orchestration plane. We do have Apache Spark applications. So we can go and say, what's happening in here? We can see there's one in progress and we can dig in and try and understand what's going on. So what does it say? So it says, it says it's shutting down. Uh, so this makes it act like it's either finished or it had an error, might have had an error. Uh, and we can go and see a little bit of stuff. So actually we can see it's done a load of setup. So it managed to set things up, it's loading the higher context and that's what we can get to. Actually that kind of makes me think it was running. Oh, now I've got a load of my stuff. So actually I think it was going through. But it's a little bit weird, it's quite hard to follow, you know, in terms of your notebook, where is it in the notebook? I've no idea. Uh, I might have some idea if we step out, but I don't get that, the nice Databricks side of things where we can just see, oh, it's currently running the notebook. This is the cell it's up to. Um, so it's a little bit hard to actually follow what it's doing. Uh, if we give that another minute or so to run, you can see if that comes back. But yeah, so I had a load of errors. I had a load of things that were kind of just kicking off and not quite working. And it took me a little while to figure out what was going on. So this first one, before I got it working, I'll show you what's happening. So the error I got back was, had an error, that's a problem. So something about wrong. It's like, okay, all right, fine. Generally something, something went wrong. Uh, digging into the actual issues behind it uh, and saying what the output is, there's a lot of stuff in here. So you get a load of logging output from running uh, your notebook. So you can see the job creation request, you can see the executor it asked for, I can see it's various submitted, scheduled, it didn't end because apparently it kind of failed. See when it's monitoring. I get a load of these URLs to go and link to some of the driver pages to understand what's going on and they don't appear to go anywhere. So I can't really, I don't know what's happening under the hood. Um, and at that point, I was just like looking at it going, well, it's, it's just not working. I can't really do anything. And I didn't really scroll down any further. Um, and then when it came back, I actually went through and I found all this stuff. So essentially, unlike Databricks, where it gives you a, note, like a notebook link, and you can go and basically just see your entire notebook, all the different cells, how it's working. Uh, instead, we've got all the different statements. I've actually got my code here. So I can run through and see what it was doing inside the actual notebook when it kicked things off. So I can see that we had, I was telling it, you've got table customer and um, the schema sales LT. And then I can see there's actually a new thing that I didn't add, which is overriding it. So I can see that it is doing parameter injection for me. It's made overriding my customer variable with my product variable, which is cool. Uh, and then I can see a lot of stuff. So I can see the other cells are doing. I don't get my printouts, which is annoying. So I'm saying, well, print this string, inject that as an F string, just so I can do some debugging and track it through. I don't, didn't get that. And I was like, maybe that's, maybe that's an error. And then 
I find an exception. The path doesn't exist. So my code was wrong. I was pointing to the wrong folder. I'd kind of switched environments and I got that wrong. So absolutely, definitely my fault. But it was like the error is so hidden down amongst that things. And it's, there's an error that should be in the standard error log. It should be able to go to the driver and just go, well, there's the error and pull it out. But it's fairly nested away. So it's a little bit tricky to try and work with and try and find. But it's just saying, which of my outputs has an error? We could probably do something with. And in fact, the one really nice thing is because this is all just part of the output, we can actually get hold of this as part of the data factory output. This is the activity, basically this is the JSON, that activity in my pipeline kicks out. So we could write something to say, find in my array if anything had an error and expose that error code. But I kind of don't want to. That's kind of something I don't really feel we should have to do in terms of going and pulling that stuff out. So yeah, I was making mistakes. My code had errors, hands up, that was me but it's quite hard to go and dig and find out what the errors and where it actually happened. Okay, so right back at the top, we can see our pipelines now succeeded. So that worked. It went in and it ran, ran my code. Um, again, I, the output I get is very similar. So I, I don't get the notebook view. I get, again, my details. It says current state monitoring still. I get these links that don't go anywhere. But then I can step through this and just say, okay, okay. So you get multiple things if it's running for a while. So ID3, so that's command three in my notebook. So the third chunk of code, which is this spark.read, essentially creating the data frame. I can see I get two things for that. So I get the first one, it's running. And if that was running for a while, I'd say it's running, it's still running, it's still running. So essentially you get monitoring pingbacks as it's watching the Spark job execute. Uh, and then we can say, okay, that finished okay. And then we get the right, and here we go. Yeah, so it was, it was running, it was still running, and then it finished, it says okay, and it kicked it out. So it ran fine. I'm just kind of sad I don't get my outputs, right? So the outputs of each cell saying, what happened there? Well, I, I've, I printed a message saying, this is what I'm doing for debugging purposes, but I can't get hold of that. I can't get to that ephemeral copy of the notebook. So it seems actually, as long as you write your code properly, it does actually work. It does actually hook up. We can go and kind of link uh, into our notebooks. Um, the other thing you saw kind of all these failures from is, this is why I was trying to be a little bit smart. I was saying, okay, so the way I was getting data into my leg was by running a get all table. So I'm doing a metadata lookup. I'm connecting to AdventureWorks saying, give me a list of all my tables and then run a copy. So just do a lookup, hitting it against, um, you know, select star from sys tables. I'm just getting back an array of all my tables, doing a data factory for each loop and saying for each of these, everything in my list of tables, I want you to run a child activity. And then in there, I'm doing two activities. One is a copy pipeline, which just says copy from A to B. Just grab it from a SQL database, land it as those Parquet files I was expecting. And then the other one basically doing that same pipeline we just had. So I'm going to call my child's pi Spark pipeline. We're going to pass in the parameters, my table name and schema name. So at runtime, we're going to change what those parameters are. The example we just had, I had them fairly hard coded. Um, and then if we go and have a look at this cleanse file. So that's the same thing, it's just a notebook. It's pointing at that same notebook we looked at, except now I'm hooking into the actual parameters. So I can run this same pipeline lots of times, passing different parameters into this child pipeline, and then run this notebook for lots of different things. And that's what I was trying to, trying to get working. And that, that works happily, uh, but you then start to look at the, how many spark pools do I have to have? How many executors do I need in my Spark pool to do it? So the errors I was getting back here is all to do with the, just, just how many calls do you want? So I, I hit my maximum of uh, 50 calls on the, um, the Spark pool, which it still feels fairly wrong. You know, so if I was doing this on the Databook side, I'd say there's a cluster, it's got eight cores, fire off 20 jobs in it. And each of those 20 jobs, I can't run them concurrently. I don't have enough cores. But it'll just fit it in. It'll go, yeah, okay, there aren't calls free. We'll just wait. As soon as it becomes free, I'll slot it in. Whereas currently we have a fairly brutal, if it can't parallelize them all at once, it's going to error. It's not just going to line them up and say, oh, yeah, yeah, it's busy, it's busy, but we'll get to it. That's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see it just waiting for the session to be available. No calls free now? Fine. Wait until the calls free. Don't just error and say, no, not allowed. Please make it bigger. And that's running on a fairly chunky um, Spark pool. So in my Spark pools, I've got from 30 to 40 nodes. 
like I said, you can you can scale up quite a lot, you know, so that and that's a fair chunk of um, processing power. I'm saying is available to this. So slightly annoying. I'm guessing that's preview stuff in terms of there's only 50 cores available. Haven't really dug into it, um, but yeah, a little bit tricky to figure out what's going on. Figure out why it's not letting stuff appear. Um, but at least the ones that were fitting inside my current Spark pool. So you can see all the copy tables ran. That was nice. And then four of my notebooks ran. So I've got the same pipeline ran with a few different things going in. And that all executed quite nicely. So there's a little bit of capacity management, a little bit of figuring out how things actually fit into your um, Spark pool. But then when we've got that sorted out, then parameterization works quite happily. Building generic workbooks that I can just pass different things to on the fly, that works quite nicely. Now, the debugging thing, I love the fact that I can actually see the outputs of all the different cells inside the data factory activity. That means I can then see it, I can interrogate it, I can pull out some uh, different parts to it. But the fact that I've got that, but then can't see the output of those cells isn't quite good enough. That's not really, it kind of loses its value. It would be a really cool feature, but it, it doesn't quite get there. Um, just to show you on the other side, if we're doing it on the, the Databricks side, the moment it starts running, we get this thing. Um, so you know, while it's, while it's executing and after the fact, uh, we get this little URL. Um, and the URL actually goes somewhere, so that's nice. Uh, <laughs> and then we can go and see, actually, so what was this? So this was a run of a notebook. Here are the parameters I put into it. And then I get the nice visual of the notebook. I can see the parameters. So this from a debugging point of view, if I set up my notebook properly, then if I'm trying to figure out, oh, what went wrong? And I can step through and say, okay, that's the path I was trying to use. That's the structure I was trying to apply. Okay, it wrote 295 rows. And that is a good support experience. Um, so great that it's exposed directly inside um, Data Factory here, but just not quite good enough that I can't really, I can't see what was going on. I can't get to the actual notebook view. I can't go and see what's happening. So maybe, some of these links, or maybe kind of that tracking URL, if that linked in the future to a view of the notebook with the results and state uh, imposed over the top of it, so we can actually say what happened during this run and get that lower level detail, that'd be a great way of things working. So that's in there. It's, it's making progress. And that's, I think that's kind of what we're seeing now. So, you know, don't know when this product's going live, but it's not live yet. And that's something we need to keep reminding ourselves that this is a work in progress. It's still in preview. And it's great that they're kind of listening to people out there saying, I'd love to be able to see that. I'd love to be able to see that. And we're slowly seeing these features trickle in now. So we had this big bang release of sign up to go and here's all the stuff in there. Here's all just, here's the first beta release essentially. And now that it's been out there for a while, we've had various different clients trying to use it. We've had various different focus groups and feedback. And we're now starting to see the features that people were saying, this should be in there. Why is that? Why is that not working? Why can't I do that kind of thing? We're starting to see those in there. So it's great to see kind of the product groups actually really getting involved and pushing this forward. Um, but we're not out there yet. We're not, we're not in production yet. So I'm really interested to see by the time it gets to production, does some of this stuff kind of clean up a little bit? Can we get this slightly cleaner view of what's going on? Can we make it easier to support? You know, I don't really necessarily want to be digging into Livy and driver logs just to find out, is my job running? Is, is it doing anything currently? Um, you know, so being able to say just, what sells it on? You know, kind of what, what statement is currently executing? What was the printed output of the last of the cells that have run so far? And abstracting that kind of user feedback, the kind of the actual cell output away from, here's all the stuff going on in the cluster. It's great to have that lower level detail, but you kind of need the surface level stuff as well. So yeah, interesting stuff. Uh, let me know if what you managed to get working with the parameter stuff. It's really interesting to see how people are gonna start using them and if we're gonna use all the same patterns that we do with Databricks of that big for each parent child loop, or if there's other ways we can work because of some of the integration we've got in signups, because of the other ways that we can actually hook into some stuff. So super, super interesting. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe if you like the video and we'll be back with some more content soon. See you later.